I know it's really early. Is anybody at all awake? Wow, there's actually hands going up. That's surprising. Cool. Well, my name is Jeremy Clark, if you haven't figured that out yet, and I'm going to be talking about focusing on the user. And that's because basically I can trace my successes and failures on the projects that I've worked on as a developer to how well I understand what the users need. And it's it's something I think I've always been doing, but haven't really recognized it. And it's one of those things that's kind of like design patterns. It's like, okay, once I put a name to this and understand it, now I can use it more intentionally. It's like, this is something I've been doing all along, but now that I see what it is, I can do it on purpose and hopefully be successful. Uh, you know, really the title of this talk is Making the World a Better Place. Because as a developer, that's what I feel my job is. And it's really hard to get trapped and say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not writing software that's like sequ uh, sequencing DNA. You know, I'm not writing anything that's curing cancer. You know, I'm not even writing anything that keeps airplanes from crashing, right? <laughs> I'm just writing everyday software for corporate, uh, corporate applications for line of business. That's where I spent the bulk of my career. But really, what I'm doing is I'm making other users' lives easier. I'm making their jobs easier. And in a way, that's making the world a better place. So that's what I focus on. I don't think about, you know, how impactful is this? You know, is it impacting thousands of lives or hundreds of lives? Maybe it's just one person. And it doesn't matter whether we're writing software that helps people communicate better. It doesn't matter if we're writing games to keep people entertained. It doesn't matter if we're writing corporate applications that just make someone's job easier. We're all trying to make the world a better place. We're problem solvers. And that's one thing that I really love about being a developer. And, you know, like I said, it's really hard to think about that when you're just a corporate developer. Is anyone here just a corporate developer? No, never raise your hand to that. Never, never. Because you don't have to just be a corporate developer. I hate that. I actually have done some interviews uh, with companies you know, and I wanted to get into a consulting company, and one person actually said, oh, you're just a corporate developer. Like, that's a bad thing. It's like, no, I'm a kick-ass corporate developer. <laughs> that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm some kind of drone that doesn't, know, doesn't care about anything. No, you can be awesome in whatever job that you're doing. So never, never say you're just a corporate developer. I'm a corporate developer, and I'm okay with that because I can be awesome. So, like I said, I'm going to be talking about some successes and failures. And I'm going to talk about my biggest failure, which actually has nothing to do with software. Actually, it has a little bit to do with software, because I was attending a software developer conference. <laughs> and so what happened is I was at this conference center, and I was just walking down the hallway on the second floor, and my phone rings, and I knew something was on fire at work already. So I like take the call, you know, and then I, I see there's a door out to the smoker's patio. So I go out the door, and I take the phone call. And, uh, you know, it's like, okay, th this is, uh, I got to take care of this. This is uh, amazing, you know. And so I'm on the phone for about five minutes, and I, as I'm there, uh, you know, I get the stuff taken care of. And then I go back to go inside the conference center, and I go up grab the door handle, pull it, and it doesn't move. I'm like, crap, it's locked. So I try the other door, grab the handle, pull it, crap. I'm like, okay, I was on the phone when I came out. I wasn't paying attention. Was this a door I'm not supposed to go out? So there's a big glass window next to it. So I go up to the window, and I knock on it to get someone's attention, and, and I like point at the door. And the person just looked at me, and they said one word to me push. <laughs> that was it. Push. <laughs> and in fact, when I pushed the door, it opened. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, this made me feel like a complete idiot. And I spent the rest of the day analyzing the situation, right? Because I'm a programmer. And so, you know, the door kind of had handles that looked like this. And so I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? Am I really an idiot? Um, I, I don't know how to use a door. There's something wrong with me. But I've done a lot of analysis on this over the years. And I found out, no, I am not an idiot. 
The person who designed this door is an idiot. And there's a couple things about it. So first of all, if you have a vertical handle, there's these things that are known as affordances. And a vertical handle tells a human, I'm supposed to pull this. A vertical bar tells a human, I'm supposed to push this. So, so that's kind of the first thing that went wrong. On this design, they wanted it to look nice, these nice glass doors with these handles. So they had the same kind of handles on the inside and the outside. So I'm sure whoever designed this thought it was beautiful. There were a couple other things going on with this, and that is normally, uh, I'm from the US, in case you haven't figured it out yet, and because of fire codes, all exterior doors generally open outwards so that you have a nice egress out of the building. Well, I was outside the building, so I would have expected the doors to open outward so I could go in. But I was on an enclosed balcony. So actually, the fire exit would be me going into the building. So the doors open inward due to fire codes. Can you tell that I did a lot of analysis on this? <laughs> now, what made me feel a whole lot better was when I found this amazing book called The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. If you haven't read that, it's really awesome. And so there's actually a term for these in the wild. They're called Norman doors because he describes the scenario. And he actually describes a time where he was going into a hotel and they had two sets of doors so that there's a little air gap in between. And he went through the first set of doors and he was you know, distracted or something and he couldn't figure out how to get through the second set of doors because it's hard to tell like, where the hinges were and where the handles were. And it's a typical thing. So I don't feel bad about this now. But at the time, I felt like a complete idiot. And this is what I want my users not to feel like. <laughs> they shouldn't feel like, oh man, I must be stupid because I don't know how this software works. That's just not acceptable. And so what I found is that the best way for me as a developer to uh, really make the world a better place, I want happy users, <laughs> is to really focus on what their needs are and make sure that my software is supporting what they need to do. Now, what they want to do and what they need to do aren't always the same thing, so there's some things that we have to kind of do to get past that. But what I found is that the, uh, the applications that I've worked on that have been most successful are ones where I've been able to build a partnership. And building partnerships is actually a tricky thing because we have to build trust with the people that are using our software. And I was working on this, you're going to hear a lot of stories, by the way, <laughs> hope you don't mind. Um, I, I was working on this large application. It impacted probably 20 or 30 different lines of business at the company that I was working with. And in that scenario, uh, pretty much everybody had similar needs except for one or two groups. Now this one group, they were actually the administrators for this application, and so they had a very specific job. And our application was actually split up into two pieces. So we had this cool Windows app, which is shown here in blue. And this was basically the administration application. So you could use it to go in and enter new items and do approvals and maintain the, the lookup tables and things like that. And then we also have this application, our green application here, which is a web application that handles all of the reporting. And we did that as a web application because it had to be wider distributed and people could just walk up to any machine and use it. So this particular, um, you know, the, the particular users that I'm thinking of were the administrators, kind of the primary administrators for the system, and they were responsible for approving the events that went through. Now, I worked pretty closely with these people when I was going through the requirements for this, when I was figuring out what they needed and how things went, but it turned out I didn't really understand their workflow because I was in their office one day just talking about something else and I'm, I'm just watching this one person do her work. And what she did was she would open up the desktop application and go to the approval screen. And that had a list of items that needed to be approved. And then what she would do is she would review the item, make sure everything was OK. And then she would click the button, yes, this is approved. Awesome. But then she did something I wasn't expecting. Because then she went to the web application that does the reporting she used the search tool to look at that same item she was just on. And once she found it, which wasn't all that great because the search function in this application was a little quirky. <laughs> so once she found it, she would click the print button, print out a hard copy of this item, and put it into her file cabinet. 
I didn't know she, ha she was doing that. And I didn't want to tell her not to do that because that was part of their process. That was how they kept track of their events. I don't want to go in and say, you don't need your file cabinet anymore. But as I watched her do this, I'm like, you know what? Rather than doing all that, you know, going to the administration application, approving an item, flipping over to the web application, printing out the report, then going back to the uh, desktop application to do more approvals, um, how about if I just put a print button on the approval screen? And that was literally five minutes of changes that I had to do. I already had that code. It's just a button that sends an ID to our reporting server. That's all it does. I, and so all I had to do was put a button on that screen. But I didn't know that that button was needed until after I watched them working. And I found that you know, really understanding that has, has changed my outlook a lot. And I try to you know, think about what are the things that I can do that are small wins? Because when we're talking about building trust, if I can make these little five-minute changes, now my users think something amazing is happening. Why? Because they're thinking, I'm on your side. That's what they're thinking. So now instead of IT being a service provider, you know, we got to go talk to the developers, and they're always nasty, and they never want to do what we want them to do. Now what I've shown them is I am invested in you. I'll I can look and make really small changes that make your life easier. And you'd be amazed how many small changes you can make <laughs> that will improve a process like this. I turned a 15-step process down into a nine-step process. And this was something they did all day long. But again, it's just from understanding what my users actually need that, uh, that made that successful. Now, I can't always make those kinds of changes because sometimes we just have restrictions. So in the same application, we had a lot of data entry. We had a lot of people doing data entry. And we had a standard data entry screen that worked for most people. But there was one group. I was actually working at the Disneyland Resort. And there was one group, the entertainment group. And their needs were a little bit different because they were putting in things like parade times, the times the fireworks would go. And I live in Anaheim, California, and there's like seriously fireworks 300 nights a year <laughs> because Disneyland's right down the street. You know, so they would put in all of these times, and the data entry screen wasn't really designed for the type of thing that they needed to put in. You know, we kind of, kind of shoehorned it in a little bit. I always wanted to write them a custom screen, but I was never able to do that. But what I did to make up for that to show them that I was on their side, is whenever they had a problem, you know, sometimes the report would come out and there'd be something that went kind of wrong with it because their constraints were kind of different from the application's constraints, I would jump on that immediately. And I would look at the data and I'd say, okay, it looks like this record has this problem and here's how you can fix it. And again, what that showed is I am on your side. So even though there's kind of a known problem with the system, and it's something I'm not able to fix, I can still help them and let them know that we can be partners. And here's how I know I was successful with that, because I was working primarily with this, this one person over the course of years, and when it was time for uh, her to leave the company and someone else was coming in and taking her place, one of the first things she did is she called me up and she said, hey, Jeremy, can you come down and meet the new person, because I want to introduce you. And I did, and she's like, this is Jeremy. He's going to help you out if you have any problems. And I love that, because I don't want to be a supplier. I want to be part of the business if I'm a corporate developer. It's like, I'm not somebody that you go to to um, you know, have, have me do things. No, it's like, I, I'm part of this. We're all trying to be successful together. And when I've had that when I've had that situation, it's just worked out so awesomely. And you don't know how hard it was for me to leave that company because I had built so many awesome relationships over the years. Now, unfortunately, things aren't always puppies and unicorns. Um, failure happens. And man, this other application, oh man, it failed like really hard. So I was working on this application and 
for whatever reason, the project manager was very protective of information. And the project manager didn't want to let me anywhere near the users. <laughs> so I was just given specifications, like here, this is what you're going to build. And it's like, you know what? I'm not a coder, I'm a problem solver. That's what I do. My job is a creative job. I solve problems. I don't just write code. And so I was very frustrated because, you know, I would come up to uh, a particular item in the specification, and I'm kind of like, okay, well, I could code it up this way, or I could code it up that way. And these are kind of like completely different things. And of course, I go to the, um, the typical question of, you know, well, what are the users doing today? I want to go look. What's your current process? How, how are you trying to put this stuff together in the manual form so that I can hopefully make something that will work for you in an electronic form? But uh, again, like I said, unfortunately, the project manager was acting as a gatekeeper here. And I got the, you shall not pass, <laughs> to go talk to the users. And I found that incredibly frustrating. Because what would happen is I would, I would pass something off, and I'd go to the project manager, and I'm like, OK, so how do the users do it now? And I'd say, here, you know, I think we could do it this way. I think we might be able to do it this way. And the project manager's all, OK, let me go talk to somebody. I don't even know if the project manager was talking directly to the users. They might have been talking to management at that level instead of the people who actually use the software. And you actually need to talk to a combination of both if you want to be really successful. So, you know, the answer came back, and I was kind of like, okay, well, you do want this one, or do you want that one? And the project manager said, do this. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what, what? What is that? Are you, are you sure? Are you sure this is what they want? And then it was even worse, because this was like a two-week process whenever I asked a question because that project manager was busy doing other things. And so this project just dragged on and on and on. And I was never confident that what I was building was something that the users actually could use and something the users actually needed. And man, it frustrated me to no end. And because of these big gaps in time of getting answers, you know, there was one other person who was working on the project. He actually ended up leaving the company, so I got his piece, which was in progress. And I was building all of this cool stuff to run on a mobile device, you know, and I'm really excited about building kind of my first mobile website, and I'm doing this really cool stuff with MVC that, like, web forms would be impossible to do with. Um, you know, and I'm, like, really proud of what I've come up with. I'm like, I put a lot of work into this, but until we kind of got some of these answers, we can't complete this application. And what happened was it was put on the back burner, and because I couldn't go talk to the users and find out what they needed, basically my manager said, you know what, work on it in your spare time. And we all know what that means. It means this thing is never going to get done. And so this application never got released. And as a developer, that's terrible for me. Because did I just make the world a better place? No. What I did was I wasted my time building code that nobody actually used. And that's time I could have spent, time, I could have spent building code that people do actually use. So to me, this is like making the world a worse place because <laughs> you're keeping me from making it better. And throwing away code is really painful. I mean, sometimes we have to do it because the code needs to be thrown away. But in this case, it, was, it just never made it to the user. They never got the benefit out of this. And you know, the, the thing is, the main reason I hate coding the specification is because specifications never, ever match reality. I mean, people think they know what they want, and then you build it and you implement it, and you're like, yeah, that didn't quite work out so well, did it? <laughs> Reality doesn't always match what specifications were given. And I love that picture. <laughs> but the thing is, I was able to use this as a learning tool. Because uh, it's really easy to treat failure as something that you get depressed over, and you want to give up, and you say, I never want to do this again. And quite honestly, that's my first reaction. But in this scenario, I'm like, okay, 
this was such a terrible thing, and I feel so bad about you know, having this wasted time and this wasted code. And even this thing I was really proud of building, I was really proud of this mobile website, and nobody ever got to see it except for me. <laughs> you know, I'm still proud of it. I'll tell people how awesome it was. But nobody ever got to see it. So to try to keep that from happening again, I thought about, OK, what was the real problem here? And again, in my scenario, I was thinking, well, I never was confident that what I was building was what the users actually needed. And so how can we make sure that doesn't happen again? And in fact, this happened to me again. I was working as a contractor at another company, and there were three levels of project manager between me and the users. And the same thing was going on. You know, I, I was like, I don't even know your industry. I am brand new to your industry, and I'm pretty sure this is not what you want. <laughs> but instead of just sucking it up, I, spoke, I, I went and voiced my concerns to the manager of the project. And I said, okay, here's what I would like to do. You know, what I would like to do, and realizing I wasn't going to be able to do it, but I figured I gotta, I gotta voice my opinion. I said, here's what I wanna do. We were rewriting an application. So there was a current application out in the field that was a little bit broken and the rewrite would use different technology and hopefully not be as broken in the same ways. And I said, you know what I would like to do? I would like to go out to the area where the people are actually using the software. I don't wanna watch them using it. And then after I watch them use it, I wanna ask them what they think the problems are. Then I wanna talk to their manager and say, what are your priorities? And what do you think the problems are, if there are any? And then we can build the software and again move forward confidently that what we're building is something that's actually useful. I didn't get to do that, <laughs> but I felt better for saying it out loud. And it turns out it made an impact because after I was done with that contract, about six months later, I got a call from that manager. And he's like, so Jeremy, can you like come over and do some, some training and a little bit more work with us? So I obviously made an impact that I care about the success of their business. Even though I'm an outsider and you know, I'm there for six months, I technically don't have a stake in whether this company succeeds or failure, fails. But you know, again, me personally, I'm trying to make the world a better place. <laughs> and so if I see something that can make that easier, then I'm gonna wanna do that. And that's where I love this slogan. I fight for the users. I've even got a t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like, that's what software is for. Software is for people to use. And it's for people to use and make their lives better. The biggest frustrations that I hear about, oh man, this story almost killed me because, you know, I have a friend that I worked with at this company for years and years, and she's not in a technical area, she's in another area. And they have a CMS system that they were using in their department. Well, because big corporate enterprise, you know, we're going to merge all the systems together so we have a single unified system, blah, 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 blah. And their process that used to take them 12 steps in the old system now took them 25 steps in the new system. And someone in that department even quit over that issue. They quit. They said, this is ridiculous. And they left. And I thought, how can we as an industry fail so badly without anybody recognizing it as a failure. I'm sure the company said, this is a success. Now everybody's using the same system. But you know what? My job isn't to make my life easier. My job is to make my users' lives easier. So when I see that kind of thing, I'm just like, come on. And there is a reason I'm not working at that company anymore. You know, I mean, that's just, unfortunately, you know, political environments change and, you know, productive environments can turn into not so productive environments. And like I said, it was really, really hard for me to leave because I had developed this relationship with my users. And I'm like, you know what, after I'm gone, I know they're not going to be as well taken care of as they have been. That was really hard for me. I, I don't know. Am I too invested in the users? What do you think? No, is this a good thing? I think it's a good thing. That's why I exist. Now, there are times where failure is on the horizon <laughs> and you can get around it. So there was this other application that I was working on 
uh, at this, this same company. Again, I spent 11 years as a corporate developer at this particular company. And it was one of those applications that was written by one of the users. You know, so every so often you'll get a department and they have someone in the department who's kind of technical. So hey, they can build this little thing in Microsoft Access and it'll be fine. You know, we don't have to go to IT for an official project and it'll be cheaper and blah, 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 blah. And then it gets too big <laughs> and the database falls over and some other things start happening. And then they come to the development team and they're like, okay, this runs our entire department now and it's not working anymore, so we need you to rewrite this. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Uh, we, can, we can rewrite this application. And I went to my manager and I said, okay, so here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to go meet with the different lines of business that are using this because it was kind of, um, you know, kind of used by various areas in this one section of the company. And, uh, you know, take a look at what they're doing today and what they need and how we can fulfill their needs and get everything good. And my manager says, nope, we, we don't have that as part of the project. So what we want you to do is do what it does today. This is a straight across rewrite. That's all you're gonna do. That does not make me happy. Because <laughs> obviously this was software that was built for a purpose, but it's also on fire right now. <laughs> so I figure, okay, you want me to do what it does today? Isn't it broken today? Isn't that why we're rewriting it? Well, yeah, 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 but just, you know, straight across functionality. And so I saw this failure coming up. I, I could see it on the horizon. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's do this. Now, unfortunately, the person who had wrote this application, you know, I dealt with several, you know, different people in the business areas that were doing this kind of thing. Some of them were really good because they knew their limitations. Some of them thought that they were geniuses and built stuff like this. <laughs> and what happened is, you know, I started going through the code and there's like 13,000 lines of VBA code. And I'm trying to figure out what this thing is doing based on the code and the tables and the forms and all that. And I came across this interesting issue. Now, I am going to teach you a little bit of geography today. I hope you don't mind. But it had this uh, function that said, hey, what time is it in this particular city in the United States? So if you said, what time is it in Omaha, Nebraska? it would come back and say, oh, it's 2.38 in the morning right now. Man, I'm about 10 minutes off, aren't I? Yeah, bummer. Because I think it's, what time is it? It's only 2.27 in Omaha right now. <laughs> I would, that would have been awesome if I nailed that, wouldn't it? Um, but the problem is, if I asked, what time is it in La Vista, Nebraska? It said, oh, it's 1.38. And that probably doesn't mean anything to you. And quite honestly, as someone who lives in California, which is where the blue dot is, and Omaha, Nebraska, which is over here, that wouldn't mean anything to me either, unless I actually looked it up. So um, here's our geography lesson. So here's a picture of the United States. And you can see Omaha, Nebraska is marked, and it's kind of almost right in the middle. OK, so here's where La Vista, Nebraska is. Yeah, did you see that? <laughs> here, let me do it again. Omaha. La Vista. Omaha, La Vista. La Vista turns out to be like a suburb of Omaha. They're really close together. And so you're probably thinking, okay, I know where this is going because time zones are really messed up. And there's probably like a time zone line that's going right through the middle of the city. And it's like, uh, no, that's actually not what's going on. You know, what's actually going on is here's Nebraska zoomed in. And there actually is a time zone that goes, a time zone line that goes through the middle of the state. So you can see the pink stuff over there is what is known as mountain time for the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And then on this side, uh, this is central time because it's kind of in the middle. We're not good at naming time zones. We have Pacific, Mountain, Central, and Eastern. And it's like, okay, <laughs> close enough. <laughs> Uh, so here's Omaha, and like I said, La Vista is just on the outskirts of Omaha. But here's what this application did. So what this, this application that was on fire did, it didn't have a connection to the outside world. So to do time zones, he was using a lookup table. And it had a list of all of the cities in the country. And so it would say, oh, Omaha, Nebraska has an offset of this. And so that's how it would figure out what time it is. But there was a problem with this. 
because the list did not include all of the cities in the country. As you might imagine, that would be a very extensive list. So it had kind of the major ones, you know, so maybe the ones that you might see here when you're zoomed in at this level on Google Maps, these are the kind of cities it would have, but obviously there's like more than 10 times as many as that. Well, the problem was is if it couldn't find a specific city on your list, like La Vista is not marked on this, what it would do is it would use the first city in that particular state. So in this case, it would use Alliance, Nebraska, because that was the first one alphabetically. And it happened to be in a different time zone. <laughs> So that's why this was broken. And obviously, I wasn't going to recreate the broken code, right? So the do what it does today, that would not work <laughs> because in that case, you know, I'd be basically saying, okay, this is gonna be wrong. And you know, like I said, on fire. <laughs> and then my brain starts spinning because these are all internal applications and they're just on the corporate network. And so I'm thinking, okay, can I like poke a hole through the firewall, maybe get out to a time server somewhere in the outside world, you know, pass them a postal code or something and they can give me the current time. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking of all these different complicated ways of doing this so that it could be correct. Well, fortunately, I had a really good partner, par partnership with the administrator of this application. So there was this one person who was out in the area. He was kind of the super user administrator for this application. And so he knew what all of the lines of business were doing. And so I tapped into him all the time. And I went to him and I said, hey, what is this function actually used for? Well, it turns out this was being used by the concierge at a hotel. And what they would like to do to kind of promote good service is two weeks before your stay, they want to call you and see if there's anything that they can do for you. Have something waiting for you in your room when you show up. You know, some spectacular guest service. That's what Disney does, right? So that's what it was actually used for. And I said, okay, so do they really need like this specific time? What, why do they need this time? And they're like, well, they just kind of want to make sure they're not calling too late in the day. You know, because again, we're on the West Coast and the rest of the country is later than us from time perspective. And so I'm like, really? So they don't kind of need this granular specific thing. He's like, no, not really. And so here's what I gave them. I went out to the US government site, nationalatlas.gov. And this is the official US time zone map. And uh, you can, Nebraska is kind of in the middle there. And uh, you can see it, it's straddling the time zones. And so what I did was I made a screen in the application that had this map on it, and then I replaced these little clocks that it has there with the actual time. So I'm like, okay, well, I can calculate the actual time uh, for each of these time zones, and let me go ahead and just put those on the screen. And that's all they needed. I didn't need to replicate this detailed functionality that was broken. <laughs> Obviously, I couldn't uh, replicate something that was broken. But because I had this good partnership, it actually worked out really well. So again, kind of people say, here's what we need. It's not always what they actually need. Sometimes it's what they, <laughs> what they think they need. And so having that partnership is really, really important. You know, um, it's really kind of difficult to build these relationships. Um, this talk is actually based on a series of articles that I've been writing over probably the last five years. And sometimes I'm thinking, how did this happen? Is it by accident? And then I'm like, you know what? It really isn't. What happens is I'm really paying attention to what my users need. And how do I know that? I do, I've done job shadowing before. Job shadowing is one of the best things you can do if you're in an environment like that. Obviously, we all build different kinds of software. But if you are building line of business applications and you can actually go spend time with the people who are, whose problem you're trying to solve, that is amazing. And if you have the ability to do that, take it. What I, um, what I kind of discovered as I was going through and, and ruminating on all this was I kind of figured out this is actually something I've been doing for years and I haven't realized it. So even before I became a professional developer, um, I was in a communications department at actually this same company. 
And in this communications department, one of my jobs was managing data in a CMS. And what they wanted me to do was, okay, this is gonna tell you how old I am and how long ago this was. <laughs> but we had a DOS-based CMS, and it had, um, you know, green, green screen, um, you know, they had monochrome monitors out there. And, um, you know, all the keyboard shortcuts for looking things up and function keys. And does anyone here, like, remember having templates on your keyboard? Yeah, I know it's hard to raise your hands because you probably have arthritis like I do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it was one of those kinds of systems. And we were moving it up to a new CMS system in Windows 3.1. You know, so it was going to be amazing. Um, but the thing was, we didn't want to just reproduce the data because it's like, oh, well, now we have the option to do linking and put in, um, you know, kind of hyper hyperlinking type things and put in images and all this other kind of stuff. So what, I, what we really wanted to do is make sure that when we move stuff over, it was still just as usable as what they were already using. So what did I do? I got to go spend time with them. <laughs> now, this act information held basically all of the information for the Disneyland Resort that a guest might want. So if people called in our guest services line, you know, and they're wanting to know, for example, about... Um, uh, assistive listening devices at various locations. That was kind of the information that was in here. The person on the phone could look it up and they say, oh yes, we have uh, you know, this available here and we have this available here and we have this uh, available over here. So they'd be able to help them with all of those kinds of questions. If they, if they say, okay, do you have designated areas for service animals? Because service animals still have to kind of do what animals do. You know, they could look at that kind of information. You know, and of course they got the typical information of what time is the parade, <laughs> you know, when are the fireworks, things like that. And so what I did was I went out and I spent a four-hour shift sitting next to someone on the phone. And it was an eye-opening experience because they got a lot of the same questions over and over and over again. You know, what time are you open? How much does it cost? <laughs> When's the parade? And they weren't even using the system for that. <laughs> Right? Because that was the question. They, they, they knew those schedules. They repeated them all the time. And so they never used the system for that kind of stuff. You know, but then when some of the, the stuff that doesn't get asked quite as much, they'd go in and look in the system and I'd, I'd see how that works. And so that was an eye-opening experience because I'm like, okay, well, you know, all of this stuff that I thought was important, right, because it's the questions everybody asks, turns out to not really be that important in the system because that's not how they get that information. And so I got to think about, okay, well, how do we actually uh, put this together in a way that you know, we, can, we can get to easily? And after I spent that four-hour shift watching somebody talk on the phone, I spent a four-hour shift talking on the phone. So yes, there, there was someone sitting right next to me making sure I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> but they actually let me sit there and answer guest questions so I could get a feel for exactly what was going on. And I knew how to use the current system not as well as they did. I mean, they would do it without looking at the keyboard and hitting function keys and control this and all that. Um, you know, I had to look up. It's like, oh, okay, I need this and this and this, <laughs> special keystrokes. Um, but, you know, I had someone there making sure that I... Uh, was saying the right thing. Uh, but again, that was really useful to me because I got to see, experience firsthand exactly what these people are going through. And I, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I've been doing this other times too. Because <laughs> there was a time where we were doing something that had to do with the people who were working out in the ticket booths, the people who were actually selling tickets to Disneyland. And I went there and stood and watched somebody for four hours out at a ticket booth. I stood behind them. And I was amazed at how much money came through that window. <laughs> they wouldn't let me touch the money, so I didn't get to actually work in that case. But, you know, I was there to observe and see what they went through, kind of see what are they doing all the time? What are they doing a little bit of the time? What are the things that are difficult? And being able to do that, man, it just, it just is an eye-opening experience. Because you're like, okay, all those things I assumed were important are totally not important. And now I'm going to build this system in a completely different way. Man, that makes you feel really inadequate because we feel like geniuses most of the time, right? It's like, oh, I am solving this problem. <laughs> and you're like, I did not solve the correct problem. <laughs> you know, it's not a good feeling to be. 
So because I've had all of these experiences over the years, I've really come up with kind of, you know, how do we form these, uh, a way to form these partnerships, a way that we can go out and figure out what our users are doing and what, um, what people need. And it's a simple five-step process. The first one is the watch step. The watch step is where we actually go and see what people are doing. And this is really difficult, especially if you're rewriting a current system. Because we have to treat this like a wildlife photographer would. And that means that if you see the zebra get stuck in the mud, you're not allowed to go pull the zebra out of the mud. You have to watch the zebra struggle, and struggle, and struggle, and hopefully get out. And that's exactly what you need to do when you're observing users. And trust me, developers are really bad at doing that. Because how many times have you like, watched a user try to do something, and you can see that it's not going very quickly, and you're like, um, can, can, can you just give me the keyboard? Just give me the keyboard. Just let me have the keyboard. <laughs> That's what we do. You know, so this is really painful. But what you need to do is step back, and this is where you see where they're struggling. Because if you don't know where they're struggling, you don't know how to make it better. So let them struggle through the process. See what they're doing today. See if they're taking weird shortcuts that you never knew existed. And you're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. That's pretty cool. And you're basically just taking notes the whole time, saying, OK, they had a problem on this. They're always on this screen. And they always go back to this screen. And they go back to the screen again. you know. So that it's like, okay, well, how can I make that process easier? Or can I just have it default? When they're done with something, I take them back there automatically. I mean, there's a lot of things to think about there. But we have to observe and watch the zebra struggle in the mud. I'm sorry, zebra? I already apologized for being American, didn't I? Uh, we have zebras in America. <laughs> Actually, we don't. What well, we do in the zoos. Um, <laughs> but you have to let it struggle and figure out, okay, how can I make this easier? Now, the next step is listening. This is where we actually talk to our users, and we ask them, how do you think it should work? And what you'll find is the things they struggled with and the things they think they struggle with are not the same thing. The other thing that you'll find is, in addition to talking to the people who are actually using the software, I want to talk to the people who are kind of in charge of those people and say, OK, what are your priorities? What do you want your people to be focusing on? And can we get the software to help them focus on that? A perfect example of that was um, you know, I mentioned doing a contract job where I didn't know the industry. <laughs> it was actually a gym, uh, it was software for gym memberships is what it was. So people could sign up for gym memberships. So of course, you know, it's one of those things everybody uses in January and then doesn't use the rest of the year. <laughs> And the particular screen that I was thinking of is all of the list of the different plans you could have. Because you could have a five-day-a-week plan or a three-day-a-week plan or one that includes a personal trainer or one that includes this other class or this or this or this. And they, they seriously had hundreds of plans that you could choose from. And so we had this list of hundreds of plans. And we had this little filter thing at the top so you could you know, filter by different um, price ranges or different aspects so they could narrow things down. But the list itself wasn't in any particular order. And that struck me as odd. I'm like, OK, um, here's what I think the manager would want. <laughs> but I don't know that without going and talking to the manager. Because I later found out that the way that these clubs work is they would have promotions they would have. So obviously, um, after Christmas and before like January 15th, they have the special New Year's resolution plan, <laughs> right? The one everybody signs up for and never uses. Well, if you have some kind of plan that you're promoting, wouldn't it make sense if that was at the top of the list? And that way, you know, the manager could say, okay, here's the plan that we're promoting this month or this week or today. And then whenever someone's using the system and they go in and say, okay, let's go over the list of plans that uh, we can get this person to sign up for, hey, they've got that one at the top of the list. Oh, here's our special for the month. Let me tell you about it. That makes perfect sense to me. 
But you don't know that unless you talk to the people who are in charge that will tell you what their priorities are. So when I'm listening to people, I want to listen to the people actually using the software, and I want to listen to the people who are in charge of the people <laughs> using the software, because their priorities might not line up. And so once I've gathered this information and, you know, got, got my, all of the things I took down while I was in my wildlife photographer phase, after I've talked to people, then I start analyzing the situation. And this is where I go crazy. Because <laughs> when we're talking about analyzing, making solutions, I love making solutions. That's what I do. And I love looking for the right technology for the job. You know, I've always, I've always, I saw this go by on Twitter a couple weeks ago, and they said, if, uh, so like if you're a consultant who goes into companies to uh, solve their problems, they said, okay, so if you go into a company with a solution already in mind, you aren't a consultant, you're a salesperson. <laughs> it's like, yeah, if I don't know the problem, how do I know the solution that I'm proposing is the right one? Well, you don't until you analyze what's actually going on. And so in the analysis phrase, we're looking at all of the different pieces that we've collected and trying to come up with something that we think might be good. And after we analyze, the next step is to contribute. So here's where we go back to our users and we say, hey, what do you think about this? Here's what I came up with. And again, from your observation, what you'll find is what the users think they need and what they actually need might not be the same thing. And there's actually a really good reason for this. It's because our users don't understand what we do. And that's OK, because we can understand that. Now, after we contribute, this again shows them that we are on their side. We keep doing it. We continue. And so we just continuously run through this cycle. So we watch them, see what they're doing, we listen to them, see what they think they need. We analyze all of what we've collected to come up with solutions. We contribute it back to them. And then we implement and we start all over again. And I have done that in, for a, a lot of different applications. And again, I can trace every successful application to the relationship that I had with the people who are actually using the software. So if you have the opportunity to interact with your users, do it. If you think there's a possibility, try to get there. And again, I realize we're, we all have different types of software, different types of companies, different types of organizations that we're building for, and we don't always have that opportunity. I worked at a, a startup for a while where we built security software, and I, I never saw a user. <laughs> I got to talk to some of our users on the phone. But then again, in that situation, I wasn't actually building the software because I don't want to build security software. <laughs> I want to leave it to the people who know how to build security software. So I was doing other things, more uh, customer relationship, helping people get our product installed and things like that. Uh, so in, it's not always possible, but when you can do that, man, you can make some really good partnerships. I had a CIO of a company that I worked for and his dream was to be asked about the color of the carpeting in the executive meeting room. Sounds like an odd dream, doesn't it? Do you know why he said that? This was interesting. I love this guy. He was awesome. He said, okay, when we're talking about things that really kind of, you know, are just about general stuff, like what color should the carpeting be in the executive meeting room, they ask the heads of all of the departments. They ask the head of HR. They ask the heads of legal. They ask the heads of finance and accounting. They ask the heads of operation. But they never ask the head of IT. They only ask the head of IT about things that specifically have to do with technology. Why? Because the company sees the technology. You're just a service provider. You're not really part of this company. You don't have a vested interest in this. And I see it completely the opposite, you know? And again, that CIO did too. He's like, you know what? I want them to ask me about something other than technology. And I've, you know, that, that made an impact on me, obviously, because I remember it all these years later. Because it's like, yeah, I'm part of the business. I am not 
you know, a service provider that's just giving software to people. Now, in order to form these partnerships, again, like I said, we have to understand the users and what they're doing. So the question is, why do we have to spend so much time understanding the users? Well, we have to know our users because the users don't know the technology. They don't know what's possible. And we shouldn't expect them to know what's possible. I've kind of come across two different types of users in my experience. I have users who ask for everything, and I have users who ask for nothing. The users who ask for everything are, are just like, okay, can I have this and this and this and this and this and this and this, and oh, I need one of these. And then the users that ask for nothing are just like, no, no it's okay. And you know what? These two types of users stem from the same problem. And the problem is they think that everything we do is magical. We're wizards. They don't know what level of effort it takes to do anything. And we can't really blame them for, for believing this because we do kind of talk that way, right? So use fourth normal form. That sounds like we're casting a spell, doesn't it? You know, and then we're killing demons all the time. That's another awesome one. They're like, what are you guys doing over there? And then, of course, we've got uh, cool things like regex Yarmum, right? I think regex is, in fact, a magical incantation because nobody actually understands it. <laughs> but, you know, these are the kinds of things that we talk about, and these are the kinds of things they're hearing. And so they don't know what's possible. They don't know level of effort. I mean, the reason why that user didn't ask for a print button on that screen is she didn't know it was even possible. And even if she thought it was possible, she's like, oh, it'll take them like two weeks to do that. It's not worth it for that. They don't understand the level of effort because, again, it's all magical. So the people who ask for everything ask for everything because they don't understand the level of effort. So they're like, ah, must be free and easy. I'm just going to ask for everything. The people who ask for nothing don't understand the level of effort. And they say, you know what? This is probably hard for them to do. It's not worth it. I'm not going to bother them with it. So this, to me, is why it's really, really important for us to understand our users. Because, you know, we need to know our users because they don't know the technology. And there was another time where I knew that I was successful. And I was successful because of a bad situation. <laughs> I knew I was successful because of a bad situation. So at this company, uh, we kind of went through a round of layoffs. You know, they cut staffing by 10% across the board. The first thing that happened is I had three different uh, of my user groups call me and say, hey, Jeremy, we just lost some people who are doing work for us. And so we have all this extra work. Can you help us automate it? They came to me because they knew that I, would, I was a good partner and that I was willing to help them out. Now, unfortunately, our department had also been cut by the same 10%. We didn't have the bandwidth for it. So I wasn't able to fulfill those needs. But it did tell me that I was successful as a partner because it's like, you know what? When they had a problem, they came to me because they knew that I was someone who was able to, who was, I'll say, willing to help, not always able to help due to extenuating circumstances, but they knew that they could count on me and that I was on their side. So again, when I think of what is my job as a software developer, it's about making the world a better place. And it doesn't have to be big things. It can be little things. We have an awesome opportunity as developers because we can multiply our impact. You know, I can build one application that impacts thousands and thousands of users, potentially hundreds of thousands of users. That's a really cool thing to be able to do. Now, another thing I do is I like to share what I've learned, obviously. That's why I'm here. Every time I share what I've learned, whether it's the projects that I've had experience with or the technical things that were difficult for me to learn, I'm able to multiply my uh, impact. So now, instead of 
me writing an application that impacts a thousand users, I talk to a hundred developers and they each impact a thousand users. So I would encourage you to share what you know. You don't have to get up on stage because I know we're not all cut out for that. <laughs> but write a blog, answer questions on Stack Overflow. Here's the thing, you know something that somebody else doesn't know. There's always someone behind you on the path. You don't have to be an expert, so help the person behind you. Find a way to do that, multiply your impact, and make the world a better place. And whenever I think about, you know what, maybe I should just code speci the specification. I don't really have the energy to go figure out what my user's doing. <sighs> you know what, I'm just gonna sit and not think about it. I'm gonna code up whatever they ask for. You know, I get passive aggressive from time to time. <laughs> And I found that there's only one thing I have to think about in that scenario. One word that will pull me out of that. And that word is push. Thank you. <laughs>